This is Anything But Footy, your unashamedly Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast with the festivities and the holiday season upon us. A lot of our key sports that we talk about every week on the podcast have wound down for the Christmas and New Year period. So as we look forward to that Christmas and New Year period, John and I are just going to reflect on some of the major sporting events, some of the major personalities and some of the big events that we have been to and been lucky enough to witness. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and over the next half an hour or so, as Michael says, we're going to look at some of the things that have stood out for us in our Olympic and Paralympic reporting careers. Uh, if you're a new listener to the podcast, you may not know all of the stories that Michael has told. Please go back and listen to them. We won't be repeating them again, generally about the Gold Coast. But no, we will be looking back at some of the things that have grabbed our attention, some of the people that have grabbed our attention. And like we said when we originally set up the podcast, is to talk about sport that doesn't get the spotlight that it deserves week in, week out. I'm interested to know, what was your first then Olympic memory? What has brought you to this point where you are passionate enough to start a podcast about Olympic, Paralympic sport off your own back? And I'm presuming the first memory is an Olympic one for you. Yeah, and I think I touched on it in probably episode one of the pod, so I'm not going to repeat the 1984 and, and LA and, and Lundin and Sarajevo, but that was when it kind of got into my consciousness but looking back I think 1988 was probably the moment I was kind of 10 11 12 years of age um, and I thought this is brilliant and it happened to be in Seoul so you woke up in the morning and there was stuff had happened all night and there was stuff going on up until lunchtime and I can remember watching Grandstand as it probably was Olympic Grandstand or Olympic Breakfast or whatever it was then Um, And the things that made me realise what an amazing sport it was, because I'd grown up as a football fan and knew football and been to football by that point, that there was so much more to sport than just football. And the grainy pictures of Redgrave and Andy Holmes uh, in the rowing really stood out for me and they won that gold medal. And they were grainy pictures, if you, know, if you, if you think back to, to, to what it was, the kind of colours all merged together and, and, and the like. And look, I was fortunate enough to then work with Andy Holmes on the boat race a few years later, um, and, and sadly he's no longer with us. Um, but that was probably one of my real memories of, that, of those games and why I have been a passionate supporter of rowing since. I ain't, I ain't a rower, as you know, Michael. I'm, I'm not the size. <laughs> you could be a cop. <laughs> That's very, very unkind of you. Um, uh, Flo jo as well was the other reason. Uh, the nails and how fast she was just really stood out. In, Again, in that. sadly, no longer with us. Uh, exactly, died at the age of 38. Um, and then the men's hockey victory o- over Germany. And, you know, we've talked so much in this podcast about the women's hockey gold from Rio but actually watching that on the television watching that gold medal and Barry Davis again I was very fortunate to work with him a bit later on that famous quote where were the Germans frankly who cares that really made me go yep I'm an Olympic fan I think and I've told the story before Torvalandin is probably the first moment I remember watching that on a black and white tv in my sister's bedroom I didn't know they'd worn purple for for years Um, but I think when it came round to Los Angeles, 1984, I remember waking up, getting up every morning, dragging the quilt down, getting on the the sofa and watching, as you put it, Olympic breakfast in 1984, the Chariots of Fire theme music that was used by the BBC. And I think the difference back then with Olympic Games to now is we were still very much then in an amateur era. Um, And I think with... All due respect to our current Olympians and Paralympians, medals were harder to come by. And when Great Britain and Northern Ireland, because Team GB wasn't a thing back then, when Great Britain and Northern Ireland won a medal in Los Angeles, it was it was big news. Roll on to, to Rio and you're winning maybe seven, eight, nine medals a day in that middle weekend when you've got rowing finals and cycling. So... Again, and it's amazing that the the names that we've spoken about no longer with us. The one name that really stands out to me and, and has stayed with me from Los Angeles is the name of Malcolm Cooper, and he was a shooter. 
and he won a gold medal. He is no longer with us. And a lot of people talk about Steve Ovet and Seb Coe and Steve Cram and Daley Thompson. Those are the names that everyone remembers from LA. And you know, my main memory of Steve Ovet was he wore a kind of different type of vest to the others. It was kind of like a string number. Um, and I, you know, 1984, I was seven, eight. That's quite a perceptive thing to have taken with me. But yeah, it was the name of of Malcolm Cooper um, and the shooter winning a gold medal in an era where we didn't win lots and lots and lots of medals that stay with me. And I can remember many years later picking up a newspaper, seeing that Malcolm Cooper had passed away and being genuinely sad because aside from, from Torval and Dean, which had happened earlier on in the year, he was, he was the first one, the first, the first gold medal moment I really recall. So what about when you then became a sports reporter and started covering some of the events that, that you do. And obviously we are anything but footy, so that doesn't apply. Um, the glory days of Leeds United and uh, Wembley with uh, Middlesbrough. But what, what was the sporting experience that you really go, yeah, that was my, that was when I, when I made it, do you know what I mean? I always wanted to cover an Olympic Games, always wanted to cover the Olympic Games and covered the London 2012 Olympics pretty much off my own back. Um, no one initially was paying me to do it. Um, I just knew I wanted to go and, and do it and try and find a story and hope that someone would pay um, for that story, which is what happened. Um, but I think saying the Olympics is probably just a little bit too easy <laughs> to say, yeah, the best thing I, I've covered was, was the Olympics. London was amazing. Rio was a different experience. It was also unbelievable. But there's a couple of events, sort of annual events, that I, I get to cover, and I feel very lucky to do so. Um, both of them in, in Yorkshire, um, which is not a coincidence because it was the whole Yorkshire story in London that, that got me going, if you like. Um, and I love them, the Tour de Yorkshire, the cycling event, for different reasons. I love the access to the cyclists at the Tour de Yorkshire. I love the fact that you can be wandering around on the start line with Mark Cavendish asking him questions literally with minutes to go. And, you know, if you're still on that start line when the, the gun goes, they're just going to ride through you. Um, and I think that's fantastic. You get such tremendous access. And the other event that I love covering is, is the World Triathlon Series, which I think Leeds hosts fantastically well. And I love it because I just think the triathletes are great. Um, you know, I think people like Georgia Taylor Brown and, and Jess Learmont, just wonderful people to very down to earth, considering, you know, they are top elite sports women, you know, on podiums at world championship level. Um, and I just think that they're great fun to speak to, especially bearing in mind they've just done a championship distance triathlon. Vicky Holland yeah, is another one, um, just again, just happy to, to chat and there was the one year where she won the Leeds leg and then 20 minutes later having spoken to me and a few other people she was in the commentary box <laughs> commentating on the on the men's event and I think the people of Yorkshire and Leeds have really taken that event to heart and they, they line the streets from round Hay Park and all around the, the city centre not always great weather for it and uh, yeah I just think those two events they're not the events that get all the massive headlines like a cricket world cup would in this country or a rugby world cup would in this country but they are two events where so many people come out and see them and and, and clearly love them and one of the events that i had the uh, fortune of covering and it does get a lot of publicity and it does get a lot of uh, focus on it is wimbledon and i'd always gone to wimbledon i was lucky enough to go with my dad and my sister and queued in the days where actually if you did join the queue, you could still get in. Well, if you go now, I mean, I've done it quite recently and you're not getting in till five o'clock, six o'clock in the evening, having been there since 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever. Or I, I ain't a camper, as you know. I was going to say, if you camped overnight, you might, you might see a bit more. The words tent and Cushing do not ever go together <laughs> in my mind. So I was fortunate that was probably in the 90s that we would go and I saw Martina Hingis play. Um, and, and queuing to see her. And then we went in the ballot, as a lot of people do, and again, were lucky enough to get Tim Henman's centre court tickets when Henman was, frankly, the best thing that had ever happened to British tennis, and people can diss him as much as they like, but... I wouldn't. Uh, you know, tennis in this country, at that point, was 
was literally non-existent apart from two weeks of Wimbledon because the BBC showed it. And he just came through, and yeah, everyone takes the mickey out of come on, Tim, and, 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 the, and the fists clench. But, you know, he won tournaments home and abroad to get to four semi-finals at, at SW19. And I was part of that, was, was an amazing thing to do. And then to go and cover the event, and what I really kind of remembered from when I'd been to Centre Court, obviously when I covered it, it had the roof on and it had been redone, was still how small it is. And, and that's what you don't really appreciate on the telly. You think it's this massive amphitheatre, but it really isn't. And you can hear people cough. And you can, and, and when people, when the, when Andy Murray looks at someone who's made a noise before he serves, he knows exactly who's done it. And he knows that, and that person, I tell you, when he gets a stare from Andy Murray, you're in trouble. So that's the thing that I really was surprised me when I went to cover that, is how, how small it was and the speed of the balls going over the net. That is the other thing. You don't appreciate on television how fast they are playing tennis. Uh, both the men and the women. And it's, it is one of those great British-English traditions, Wimbledon, but it's also a fantastic sporting event. And I think that we probably don't quite appreciate how lucky we are that we have that on our tellies every year and that we get to stage that every year. As a journalist, though, going to cover Wimbledon, I talked about the access you get to, to cyclists and uh, the triathlon and, and the, the cycling... My, I've, I've never been to Wimbledon as a reporter. I've been as a, as a tennis fan. But my, my guess would be it's quite stuffy, difficult to cover as a reporter. Is that no, fair? I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't think that is fair. I think it's actually quite relaxed. Um, so everybody has to come and do a press conference afterwards where you can, as a member of the media, you can sit in that press conference and ask questions. Um, some that... Johanna Conta don't doesn't quite like ask, being asked, but <laughs> we've all fallen out with Johanna Conta <laughs> interviews. <laughs> Your mate, um, but you can also, you know, you can be a rights holder if you like, um, which means that you pay the All England Club to be able to broadcast live from there, and you can request interviews with athletes. Um, obviously, the, the the kind of up and coming athletes are more likely to do some of the smaller ones, but I've actually found that. The organisation and the people all really want to bend over backwards and help you. And actually, they know that you are there to promote their sport and promote their event, which I think some people who stage events in this country, Premier League, um, don't quite appreciate how much you know, coverage they get and, and how much work the media does do and get it to a population that doesn't necessarily see it in front of them all the time. And I think Wimbledon, although they do have the BBC for two weeks, um, you know, doing their promotion, if you like, but actually it's important that they're in the newspapers. It's important they're on social media. It's important they're on other radio stations. It's important they're on podcasts. And they realise that. And that's what's really nice about it. Famously, in Rio at the Olympics, there was a huge press conference with Andy Murray. And you stuck your hand up, introduced yourself. And Andy went, oh, I love listening to you in the morning. Uh, which caught us all by surprise, um, by the way. In fact, I think I was out of the building having an argument with Joanna Conta at exactly <laughs> the same time. But who, who have you loved interviewing? Who have you mm. enjoyed meeting and chatting to? Yeah, that's a really tough question because when you think back on it, and you know, I've recently you know decided that I was going to change my my full time job, if you like, and loads of people said, "What's your highlight? What's your what's your favourite moment?" And you all you remember is the bad. Sadly, all they remember is the bad times. Um, the Joanna Conter interviews <laughs> <laughs> that, that just come through to mind. So it's, you have to really think, and I have thought about it. And obviously, Usain Bolt is someone that. As a sporting legend, the fact that I've asked him a few questions, and you have, and we've had that pleasure of talking to him, what reasonably one on one. Yeah, you do kind of feel in that mix zone, which is that area where you you do those interviews. I've always felt, certainly with the circus that follows Usain Bolt, that you you're kind of just yelling things at him. And certainly when I've listened back to them, they don't sound like the most considered interviews. I remember saying to Usain Bolt at London. 2017 you were probably stood next to me um and it, there's so many people demanding of his time i thought to myself i've got to try and ask him something different here 
And I said, if Muhammad Ali was the greatest and Alex Ferguson the boss, because he's a huge Man United fan, then what's Usain Bolt? And you saw that little flicker in the eye where he thought, and it was fantastic for me, where he thought, I've not been asked that before, actually. Mm. How, how would I describe myself in, in that kind of description? And I think as a journalist, you need to try and think of those questions, not only because you're trying to tell a story for the listener or the, the viewer or the reader, but actually you're trying to make an impression with, with these sportsmen and women that, you, A, you know what you're talking about, but also that they might go away and go, oh, yeah, I quite enjoyed that one today. Because there are, as you say, that mix zone is a procession of questions and time and time again. It's and, a sausage and, factory. Yeah, and, and, and someone else who I would always say I thought was a joy to interview was Jess Ennis-Hill. She always stopped and spoke, even when she was the face of London 2012. And in fact... Uh, one of my first ever kind of assignments when I became Olympic correspondent in, in 2012, I had to go to the, the trials in Birmingham. The, the, I knew that I had to go and cover the trials. I knew that if I went and got some interviews, then the radio stations I worked for wanted to, to run the likes of Jess Ennis Hill. And I was totally out of my comfort zone and never had been before and stood in a mix zone and thought, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not the biggest. I have to push my way to, to do that. But actually, she had done the BBC, as she would do with the rights holders, but ITV were there, Sky were there, everybody was there because she was the, the poster girl of, of 2012. And she, I was right at the end because radio is always at the end, as you know, behind the barriers. Um, and you get two questions and... But actually, I said, as she was walking by, Jess, would you just have a quick word with us? And Tony Mincello was there, her coach, and he kind of looked at me and was just like, no, no way, mate. But actually, she stopped and she did answer two or three questions. And I got a 60-second piece, which from a commercial radio point of view for who I was working with, was music to my ears. And I will never forget that. And she will never remember it. It was in a tent. It wasn't even in a glamorous mix zone. It was in the back of the Alexander Stadium. But she always spoke. And even in Rio, where she came out, and she would have been gutted that she got a silver medal in Rio, um, you know, wanting to defend that Hattathlon title. She came out at 7 o'clock in the morning and spoke to us outside. And actually, so yes, I've spoken to Bradley Wiggins. Yes, I've spoken to Mo Farah. I love Max Whitlock as well, uh, who, who's, who's currently around, and I love interviewing him. Um, but for me, Jess is, is probably up there for the best interviewee. The person you'd never get a 60-second interview from in the world of athletics is Greg Rutherford. There is a guy <laughs> that likes to talk, but is worth listening to because what I've always enjoyed about the time I've spent with Greg is he has opinions and he has some strong opinions and in this job you're often after a line if that makes sense you want a headline and Greg was always willing and able to give you a headline you know whether it was attacking the organisation that paid his wages because they didn't put the British flag on a vest. Yep. Whether it was attacking um, doping cheats, if you ask him about that, and I've said this many times, part of the problem around doping for me is that not enough of the big-name athletes seem that bothered about it when you ask them. Greg Rutherford did seem bothered about it. He was just a very all-round good guy. I covered his very last appearance, which was a jump in the City Games in, in Newcastle. He then had to cross the bridge to Gateshead for his media commitments. Everyone wanted a selfie. Everyone wanted an autograph. He, he did them all. He managed to get on the BBC with, with seconds to spare. And he put his arm around my shoulder and went, right, mate, shall we go somewhere a bit quieter? Because he knew that I wanted to do a little bit of a retrospective. And, you know, I've maybe interviewed him a, a dozen times. I once turned down the opportunity of interviewing Roger Moore to interview Greg Rutherford, which in hindsight... I wish I'd gone and spoken to James Bond because I spoke to Greg Rutherford loads. Um, but I know, I think just an all-round good guy, a mix own hero. I just want to mention one other person, that's Justin Rose, because going right back to where we started, talking about trying to sort of make an impact with these people. First time I saw met Justin Rose was at the Open, just ahead of the Rio Olympics. I think it was in Troon, big press conference. And I thought, how am I going to get Justin Rose to answer my question and then when he gets to Rio I and mean, at that point we didn't know he was going to win the gold medal but when he gets to Rio maybe have a glimmer of recognition and, and want to do more interviews with me and so I said 
Mo's got his Mobot, Usain's got his Lightning Bolt. What's what are you going to do on the final green when you won a gold medal? Which was quite a prediction at the time, and uh, and we came up with this idea that he was going to do this rosebud, which was this silly dance thing that he he came up with. And then we got to Rio and he came to see us and he remembered it. He remembered the rosebud, and then when he won his gold medal, his agent was desperate to drag him off, but he was happy to stop in the car park in the dark and do another interview with me. So he's another mix zone hero. This is Anything But Footy, your Olympic and Paralympic podcast as we are enjoying the festivities, uh, about to head into them. We thought we'd uh, look back at some of the events and the experiences that we, Michael and I, have had covering uh, Olympic and Paralympic sport. And you mentioned there about Justin Rose, and that might be the answer to the next question, is your best Olympic moment which you've witnessed? Well, seeing Justin Rose was was right up there. I'm a huge golf fan. Um, I didn't join in all the hullabaloo about golf not shouldn't be in, in the Olympics. I thought it's a great sport to go into the Olympics and certainly in Rio where you know I hope it maybe helps develop the game a little bit. That was a great moment. Uh, the women's hockey final, which you and I went to together, um, that was brilliant. Um, and I think... I've said time and time again that was probably the, you know the standout moment in Rio. But I went to see Usain Bolt run the hundred meters final in London as a fan, and I've told you this before. My friend and I went into the ballot for tickets together. We said whatever we're going to get, we'll split. I got handball semi-final tickets. He got the men's one hundred meters final. But he honoured his his promise. So thank you to to James, my best man. Godfather to my youngest daughter for that, and uh, yeah, we went to see as as fans. I took the night off, and we went to see Usain Bolt, and it was the night after Super Saturday. Um, there was a, a medal, a Super Saturday medal presented, so we heard the national anthem. Christina Hurugu ran that night and won a medal as well. And then randomly, I got a text message during it to say Andy Murray and Laura Robson have won at Wim- have won a silver at Wimbledon, and Andy's won a gold. Uh, he's doing some interviews. If you want to get yourself to this room in the Westfield Shopping Centre, um, you can interview Andy Murray. And um, so I watched Usain Bolt in the early evening, uh, finished the session, and then wandered down into the shopping centre to go and interview Laura Robson and, and Andy Murray. And I've always carried that, that I've, I've done a, a one-on-one interview with Andy Murray and all the great things he went on to achieve. I'm yeah. sure it was nothing to do with my interview. <laughs> You? I mean, I watched every gold medal performance on 2012, but on the telly, because uh, that was my job. I had to watch it and, re- and report on it. And, you know, when people say, oh, what was your, the highlight of 2012? It was, you know, covering that and, and, cover- and being there. But actually, then going to Rio, which wasn't, there wasn't quite the intensity required for live coverage. We dragged you out to a few things in Rio. Yeah, I probably it, saw more stuff in Rio yeah, and than I, I did in London. got the feeling, you know, we were working for opposition radio stations at the time, but obviously we were working the same beat and we knew each other pretty well. I got the feeling in the first week that you were wedded to the desk a little bit and then that recollection or realisation rather that, actually you were in Rio and you know there was some some stuff to go and see and, and we got you out to the hockey and and a few other bits and pieces and yeah I mean you know being on Copacabana Beach when you know Ali Brownlee won the triathlon gold medal and then chasing around <laughs> the, uh, the 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 town and various Literally. hotels to go and interview him is, is, a, is a total and utter highlight you're absolutely right um being we're not talking about footy but being in the Maracan R and seeing Neymar score for Brazil in the Maracan you don't you don't get life experiences like that on an every every day or every year. Um, but I had to look on my Twitter account bizarrely when I was thinking about this question, and on my pinned profile is still a picture that I took being in the velodrome on the twelfth of August, twenty sixteen, when Sir Bradley Wiggins and the team pursuit. British team won the gold medal and it was his fifth gold medal it was his eighth medal overall it was a record at that point for a British Olympian and then I got to interview him a couple of days later yeah on a a one-on-one to that is that 
what happens at those events is a couple of days later, as you say, they will the 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 big names, the biggest names, um, will be put up for media, but they will only do one television interview, one newspaper interview, one radio interview, and then that radio's interview circulated to everyone that wants it. And you were the one selected to to do the interview on behalf of all the rest of us yeah, with, with Bradley I, Wiggins. And uh, you know, and there's a lot been said about Bradley Wiggins, and there's a few question marks hanging over him um, and his career. But I remember back in London in 2007 interviewing him when he was a virtual unknown, and London was about to stage the the the, the part of the Tour de France, and he was the face of British cycling at that point coming through and. I was on, and I really liked him then, and I continue to have to have liked him. And, and interviewing him in Rio, he, he was different. Um, and I talked actually, I asked him about Tokyo whether he would be around for Tokyo, and obviously he's he's not, and he's gone and done other things, which I think is is probably the right thing for him to do. Um, but I think it's it's one of those moments where to be in a velodrome, and I've talked about this a lot on a podcast. The velodromes are an amazing atmosphere. But to be there and actually grab the picture as well. I grabbed the picture on the finish line. Um, and they're going so fast, it's slightly blurred. Um, to then go and interview him and talk again about his career and being the greatest Olympian in British history at the moment is uh, certainly an honour. It was a good interview as well because you had to send it to me to, to circulate and I enjoyed it. I had the pressure. It. I had the pressure. Though. That's the thing. When you're the pool, you can't, yeah. you can't get it wrong. And you have to cover all the bases, of course. <laughs> If you had one Olympic wish, then for the the future, if you could, if you could wave your your magic wand, what would what would you like to do? Uh, this one's a really easy one for me, and I go back to what we talked about at the start. Seoul, nineteen eighty eight, was the bit where I realised the Olympics was what I enjoyed and thought it was brilliant. But one of those moments was Ben Johnson getting stripped of his gold medal, and you kind of hoped that drugs would not still be as front and center as it is and as we approach tokyo uh, russia have proved that it is still a major part of the olympics um unfortunately so for me my one olympic wish would be that every drugs cheat gets caught and thrown out and we never see them again i don't care about the human rights it's utter nonsense to say that they can come back as Justin Gatlin has done several times and compete go and have another career there's no there's nothing in the world that says you have a right to run and if you've broken the rules then you deserve to be thrown out and that's what I would like to happen in the future is a clean sport and I'm not one of these people who wants to just um, say oh let every, let them take everything no it's about you know man versus man woman versus woman uh, and sometimes as we progress in the olympics men versus women as well which is great to see but that's all and the drugs should just not be there well you've gone for a pretty serious olympic wish and i can't disagree with a word you've just said and i wish i'd thought of that myself as the answer <laughs> um, my olympic wishes are slightly more flippant i one love to see squash in the Olympics. I, it's, it's never going to happen. Well, I, I wouldn't say never, but I just think it's... When, when you go back to this idea that winning an Olympic gold medal should, should be a pinnacle, it, it would be for squash, and they've worked so hard to develop the, the experience of watching a game of squash that you know, I would have loved to have seen the likes of James Wolstrop and, and Nick Matthew, having watched them at Commonwealth Games level, and how exciting their matches where I'd have loved to have seen them have the opportunity. And I, I do wonder, you know, in that, you know, when Seoul in 88 hosted, they brought in Taekwondo as a, as a demonstration sport, whether London could have maybe done something similar because, you know, Great Britain had two of the top squash players in the world. It wouldn't have been an expensive sport to host because there's been some imaginative stagings of squash. You know, I've seen it at the KC Stadium in Hull. I've seen it in shopping centres. So I think London maybe could have, could have put it on as a demonstration sport. I don't know that, but you know, I, I kind of wish it would. Um, but I think my, my one Olympic wish would be to see the Olympic Games come back to Great Britain. Um, but I don't want it to be back in London. You know, I, I, I just think London hosted what was just a, a perfect 17 days. It um, wasn't perfect, but it, 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 was, it was a fantastic experience. And I just don't think we'd do it quite as good again or because we've already done it once, we wouldn't have that fervour and excitement. So 
I look around and think, well, what, what is the next best city? And I don't think there's an appetite of the IOC to go to Manchester or to Birmingham, as, as good as Commonwealth Games hosts as Manchester was, and Birmingham will be, I'm sure. Glasgow. I think Glasgow has is, is got to be the, the next in line, and I think a Scottish Olympics in Glasgow that you know, and a lot of the facilities are there. It, it could be Glasgow and Edinburgh as well. Yeah, it? I think it would so have close. to be. It would have to be because you'd need to use the Commonwealth pool like they did in in Glasgow 2014 for for diving, for example. You'd obviously need to you know have Hamden um, put back into a, an athletic setup. But as the as the pool of potential Olympic host cities shrinks, if Great Britain was ever to have a tilt at it again. And I'm not sure that they will any time soon. Glasgow would be would be the one for me. It might uh, depend on a certain vote over <laughs> the uh, over the next few years. Um, talking of what will be coming up in the next few years, a prediction for Tokyo 2020. A few predictions for um, Tokyo 2020. Um, I don't think Great Britain will be as successful as they were in, in Rio. I think there'll be a lot of sports uh, where medals were won in Rio where we will struggle to win medals. I think rowing and probably cyc- track cycling will be down. Um, I think I would be very surprised if, you know, there's a, uh, a replica of the hockey medal. Can't, I can't see the men or the women at this stage um, getting a medal. Same with rugby sevens. Um, so I think uh, that Great Britain, unfortunately, I still think they'll be successful. I still think they'll be in the top six to eight on the medals table, but I can't see them being as high as they were. But if I was to make one prediction for Tokyo 2020, that is that Tom Daly will carry the Great Britain flag in on the opening ceremony. A man that went to the Olympics as a boy, um, age 14, in Beijing, uh, won a medal in, in London, was box office Saturday night TV, the last Saturday night of the, the games and prime time BBC One. I went to, to Rio, got another medal, then, you know, really just got it all wrong in his individual event as well. Um, has been just a fantastic ambassador diving in this country is, is pretty much, I know Pete Waterfield obviously came before him, but diving in the programme in this country has pretty much been based on his success at Olympic and world level. And I think the athletes and the sports will, will recognise that and give him the flag to carry. That'll be interesting to see. I think we all know Adam Peaty's going to win a gold medal um, in the swimming pool. Won't be at the opening ceremony, though, I wouldn't have thought, would no. he? The swimmers. No. Um, Andy Murray, I've said before. Carried will, the flag last time. Will win a medal, I think. Um, of course, he's got three already from 2012 and 2016. Um, he did also go to Beijing, which I'd forgotten. Um, didn't. Quite Tim Henman there. won a silver medal at the Olympics. He of did course, in '96. Well. A lot of people forget that in, in that a, in Atlanta atrocious games for Great Britain. Actually, Neil Broad and yeah. Tim yeah. Tim Henman won won a medal. So come on then, pushing you on your prediction. So the one prediction, mince pie to eat. Adam Jamili is going to win a medal, an individual medal in the sprints. More likely the 200 meters because I think he'll learn from his mistake at the Doha World Championships where he led with about 20 meters to go and rocked and rolled over the line to finish fourth. And he finished fourth in Rio. And I just think it's his time. Um, so Adam Jamili to, to win a medal, an individual medal at the Olympics in Tokyo 2020. Sorry, Adam. Well, hopefully we've outlined our Olympic and Paralympic reporting credentials a little bit for you there on what has been a slightly different episode of Anything But Footy. Don't forget, of course, your weekly dose of all things Olympic and Paralympic sport. You can find us online, of course, at anythingbutfooty.com. Uh, we'd love to get your messages over the holiday period as well. So if you want to drop us a tweet, it's at anythingbutf. You can also email us, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. And you can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, and also on Twitter. <laughs>